Thank you very much for the introduction there. Um, what I'm going to do today is, is to give two lectures. Um, and uh, normally when I give a lecture, the, the chairman shuts me up at a certain point. Uh, but now I can do two. I can tell you everything more than you really want to know about the climate change and the Arctic and what it's doing to us. Um, so in this first one, I'll be talking about the actual uh, the behavior of ice on the planet, what it's doing, why is it disappearing, and what are the implications of that. Um, uh, we know that the, that the sea ice in the Arctic is, is vanishing, um, but, and finally that's being accepted that it's happening because it is happening, but um, the general view is, well, so what? Um, it's, there's, there's a lot of change going on in the world, um, things that we're used to are disappearing. The, the glaciers on the top of Kilimanjaro are melting. It doesn't matter about to the rest of the world if sea ice disappears. But in fact, it turns out that it does. It turns out, in fact, that, that the consequences of sea ice disappearance are more severe than the actual fact of sea ice disappearance itself because there are feedbacks which have impact on the entire global atmosphere in the entire global climate. And those impacts are, are much more serious than, than people have appreciated. So I'm going to start by talking about the ice itself and how it behaves. Then I'll start talking about the impacts. Um, and I'll deal with a couple of them in this lecture. That's the, uh, the way in which uh, global warming is accelerated by the loss of ice, which changes the amount of radiation reflected back into space, so the albedo of the planet. And then I'll talk about how the disappearance of ice accelerates um, global sea level rise. So then this afternoon I'll talk about the other impacts, especially the ones which this, this uh, conference is very concerned with, which is the impact on food production and the impact on weather and what that means for the, for the people of the planet and therefore what we ought to be doing about it and ending up with a plea for uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere as the way to save ourselves. Um, so I'll start off by talking about the ice itself. And um, this is... <laughs> already I've done it wrong. Uh, <laughs> right. Well... Um, there we are. Uh, well, uh, in, in talking about the loss of ice, I'm obviously uh, also uh, promoting my book on the subject, which, um, which came out um, in England at uh, the end of 2016. It, the title was stolen from Hemingway. And it came out in, in the US, uh, updated, because things have gone on very, f have advanced very much in a year, the, all the... All the uh, uh, ice concentrations in the Arctic have gone down, so it's got new graphs in it, uh, and came out in, in, in September with the uh, uh, Oxford University Press in the US. And um, it's also, if, if in case, you, in case you, you travel globally and speak other languages, you could find an Italian edition, a Dutch edition, a Japanese, Chinese uh, editions, um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the latest one is the, is the Italian edition, in fact. Um, but the most attractive one is the Dutch edition, because that's got more pictures in. But I, unfortunately, I, I can't read it, and nor can anybody else that I know. Um, anyway, the, so we start off by, let's look at what's happened to the Arctic Ocean. For people who go there frequently, the changes are actually enormous. So this is the Arctic as it was in 1970. This was the first time I, I went to the Arctic and uh, was sailing through the Northwest Passage on a Canadian oceanographic ship. And there, there's, the, there's the ship up there, oh, wow, there it is, uh, called the Hudson. Um, it was accomplishing the first circumnavigation of North and South America on a voyage called the Hudson 70 expedition. That was the first, in fact, the only time that a ship has sailed around North and South America. So I was very lucky as a young 
uh, graduate, I was able to be a, a low-grade low research assistant on this ship and actually sat on board for the whole voyage. So I was accomplished the first circumnavigation of the Americas on this ship. We sailed from Nova Scotia down through around South America to the Antarctic, up through the Pacific, and then the last leg was coming through the Northwest Passage from Alaska through the Canadian Arctic back to Nova Scotia. And, this, and as we came across the, the north of um, Alaska and sort of turned right at the Bering Strait, this was the ice we ran into. It was, it was summer and of, the ice is broken up, um, partly melted, but you could see that it's still a very, very formidable barrier. Um, this ice is, is called multi-year ice. It's more than a year old, some of it's several years old. It's very thick, three or four meters thick. Um, the ship could push through it, it wouldn't have been able to break it. Uh, but these are very formidable ice flows, uh, rugged, very, very thick. Uh, and this is just a few miles off the coast of Alaska. So there's, a, there's this, then there's about a mile or two of open water, then you have the north coast of Alaska. Uh, so this is what you, you found in that area in 1970. And then in contrast, we look at, 19, about at 2014, which was a more recent voyage I was on up there. This, this is the Healy, US Coast Guard icebreaker. And we're now in the same longitude, we're off the north coast of Alaska, but we're 300 miles north of, of the coast. So instead of being one or two miles of open water, there's, there's 300 miles of open water, and the ice is very pathetic, as, as you can see. We weren't even allowed to stand on it by the captain in case we fell through. Uh, so this is, it's very thin, it's rotten, it's melting, and in fact, within a week or two of that, uh, of, of that voyage, uh, we were sailing further north, and the ice was melting as we went. So that's, that's the both sea, the southern part of the Arctic Ocean today, uh, which is, you can see is completely different from the way it was in 1970. Uh, okay. um, well, let's look at something's happened, obviously, to the ice in, in the Arctic. It's disappearing. Uh, but let's look at ice in the world and what's, what's been happening to that. So we, we, uh, if we... Ah, yeah, do that. Um, uh, the challenge is t to make this thing go backwards. <laughs> uh, it, the bottom one. Uh, okay. Um, I'm, I can free. I'm free to walk. Uh, 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 if we this this graph is is on several different scales. It takes us through history. Through uh, it, it's it's quite nice because you you change scale. So from a hundred million to five hundred million years ago, the temp the average temperature of the planet, which is the, the vertical scale was it, it, it oscillated about a lot. We don't understand why, because it was such a long time ago. The distribution of continents was different. Uh, but on the whole, it was several degrees warmer than it is today. The zero is, um, zero is the present average, ed, average temperature. Um, and so we're looking at 15 to 20 degrees warmer than it is today. Then. Um, when we came through a period called the Eemian, um, the, which was about 40 or 50 million years ago, the planet started to cool off, and it gradually cooled off uh, through that period from 60 to 10 million, and then it cooled off some more um, between uh, 10 million and 1 million years ago, and we got into a state where the planet was just about cool enough for ice and snow to form. And the, the, but it didn't happen that we had, we had sort of moving into a, an ice-ridden planet. We had an oscillation between an, uh, an icy period 
and a non-icy period. And that's, those are the ice ages uh, the, between uh, deep ice age and interglacial. And that's, that's actually driven, that's these little oscillations here over the last um, few hundred thousand years. <clears throat> Those are driven by astronomical factors, in fact. There, there's, um, it's called the, Mil the Milankovic variations, and they named this after Milankovic, who was a Serbian geophysicist, but really and truly the person who, who, who discovered these oscillations was called Kroll, and he was an, uh, uh, he was an uneducated Scottish wonderful person. He worked in, the, uh, in a research institute in, in Edinburgh as a janitor and he read all the books in the library and he kept coming up with brilliant ideas. So he was a, a, an un, 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 unschooled genius and he never got, of course, any credit, but uh, he does now because the, 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 the Scots are very, very proud of him. So they should be called Kroll variations, but they're actually called Milankovitch variations. And what happens is the, there isn't any change in the amount of total amount of radiation reaching the Earth from, from the sun, but there's a change in the seasonality of it, and, a, and that, that's enough to produce a change in the total amount of heating of the planet. This is because um, as the, the Earth is tilted on its axis, at, at, a, at a, an average of about 23 and a half degrees at the moment to, to the plane of its orbit around the sun. So it's, it's tilted, and that tilt is, is the latitude of the tropics and 90 degrees minus the latitude of the Arctic Circle. So that, that, that uh, tilt changes with time. Gradually, the, over a period of about 100,000 years, uh, the tilt of the Earth's axis relative to the, uh, the plane of the Earth's orbit goes through a, a sequence that takes it from about 21 degrees to about 25 degrees. So it, the Earth is, is gradually, it's like a top which, which hasn't been quite wound up enough and it, it, it's, it's wobbling. So this is called the Chandler wobble and it's, it does make a difference and, and it means that the, the latitude of the tropics of the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn and the latitude of the Arctic Circle changes with time and over a distance of about two or three hundred miles. That's enough to, to change the, the distribution of radiation reaching the Earth. And when the Earth is tilting a lot, then there's more radiation reaching the Northern Hemisphere relative to the Southern Hemisphere. And the Southern Hemisphere is mainly water, the Northern Hemisphere is mainly land. And that affects the absorption of that radiation. So the story of by Milankovitch is, is that although as a ball sitting in space, we get the same amount of radiation from the sun, whatever happens, in, in practice, that radiation is not distributed uniformly between northern and southern hemisphere because of this Chandler wobble. There's also a couple of other wobbles. One of them is that the the, the Earth's orbit, which is a, um, a, an ellipse, it flattens out and then becomes more stretched again over about a 100,000 year period. That's the second uh, variation. And then the third one is that the, this, the whole orbit precesses so that the time of year at which we're closest to the sun changes with time. And at the moment, the northern hemisphere is closest to the sun in February, that's now, so you wouldn't, you don't, you don't feel it, but we're closest for the entire year, we're now closest to the sun. Um, and that changes again with time. So there's these three slow variations, and when you add them together, they, they give you a variation in radiation received by the Earth. And that's enough, according to Milankovitch anyway, to make a difference to because the Earth is just on the, on this pitched on this boundary between having ice and not having ice, then the Milankovitch variations cause the Earth to go through a cycle of being very icy with um, glaciers everywhere. Uh, that's the Ice Age, and then coming out of that and going into a warm period called an interglacial, 
which we're in at the moment. So it couldn't start doing that until it had cooled down, so it, it didn't start doing that till about a million years ago. Um, and then it's been doing it ever since with periods of about 100,000 years. And now this last bit of the map shows us uh, that's expanded. That's what's happened since the last Ice Age ended, which was 20,000 years ago. The Earth came out of the last Ice Age and came up to this um, present state, which has been in for about the last 10,000 years. That's an interglacial. We've been in it longer than, than most interglacials. In fact, we're, we're, we're set. We, we ought to be set to start descending towards another ice age. But it looks as if, uh, thanks to man's activities, we're not going to do so. And um, we're going to miss out on the next ice age. Um, that's whether that's good or bad. I, I don't know. <laughs> depends <laughs> how you feel your great, 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 great grandchildren would feel about that. Um, so that's the, that's the situation. The, the, these Milankovitch variations causing ice ages, but only, only for about a million years. And then uh, th before that, the Earth was warm all the time, everywhere. Mm -hmm.